Hello, and welcome to the Sunday Meditation at the Light Institute of Galileo and the Sanctuary of Light. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we divide our meditation into three parts. In the first part, we ask our divine higher selves to take form so that we align with our true self with a, with a higher frequency that belongs to us. And then we ask the higher self to touch our body. We draw it into our body so that as we're sitting in meditation, we are sitting in this higher frequency. I will make a little om sound so that you can push the button on your apparatus and meditate for as long as you like. In the second part of the meditation, we practice the art of radiance because everything is made of light. So by reaching up into the cosmos, we pull down a beautiful beam of white light down to the top of your head and down into your solar plexus. This is the center of our emotional bodies. And from here, we laser that white light out across the planet and back up into the cosmos. And for that part of the meditation, you breathe in, draw it down, exhale, laser it out, and you just keep doing that. As you do that, you will find that it does bring you into a deep state of meditation. Another OM. And then in the third part, each week, uh, people suggest something for us to take this energy, this cosmic energy that's, that's connecting to us, and extend it in a special way out into the world. This week, we're going to extend the highest frequencies of light to all of those, almost in so many countries, uh, they are having elections. And so there are new people who are coming into power. I long for the day when we will uh, have that power and those choices within us, and it will come. But right now, we need to help all of those who actually do have power over the lives of others, of countries, even in the global world, that, that we help them to actually have illumination so that they can see all the way around, not just their own point of view, but what is for the good of the whole. And so we will do that by gathering. For you, it might be whoever is running for commissioner of your area or your state or your country or all of the people who are coming into power on the planet. However it comes to you to do it is fine. And you simply bring them into your mind's eye and ask them what frequency of light they need from you to find that point of illumination. And that's how we do it. It really does influence uh, the direction and the consciousness of others. So we'll begin by breathing slowly in through our nose and exhaling even more slowly because when you exhale, it slows your brain and allows you to expand your consciousness. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath in through your nose and exhale very slowly, slowing your brain, expanding your consciousness through your mouth. Breathe in through your nose and exhale again slowly through your mouth. Now, ask your higher self. It's the intuitive essence of your soul. It's your own wise inner voice. Ask it to take a form for you. It could come as a being or a light, a tree, an animal, an equation. Just ask for the form. See what you get. Now ask your higher self to touch the place in your body where you hold your divine essence at this moment. And just imagine anywhere in your body that your higher self is touching.
And now breathe deeply into that place. And feel as you breathe into that point that you're creating this spin point, opening this point of divine source. And through that point, imagine that you're drawing your higher self into your body so that you sit in meditation with your own higher self, your own inner voice. Um. Imagine that you are reaching up into the cosmos and pulling down to you a beautiful beam of pure white light. Feel it penetrate the top of your head, come down into your solar plexus, your stomach, and from there laser that white light out through your auric field, out across the planet, and back into the cosmos, and then breathe in and draw it down and exhale and laser it out, and just continue to do that patterning so that it carries you into a deep inner space of consciousness. Take a deep breath into your body and just see wherever your higher self has shown you a person or a group who are now going to be leaders who have the power over the lives of others, choices even on a global level or a community level or even a family level. Bring them into your mind's eye now. And ask them what frequency of light they need from you in order to feel an illumination, a clarity, so that their consciousness is able to help them to be wise and clear in using the power that they have. See what color they show you at this moment. Whatever color comes to you, again, reach up into the cosmos and pull that exact color, that frequency of light, down through the top of your head, into your stomach, your solar plexus, and laser that color out to them. And feel that light penetrating them, illuminating them, allowing them to expand their agendas, their needs, onto a more expanded arena for the good of the whole. Just continue to extend that frequency of light to them. Oh. Take a deep breath and open your eyes. Thank you for that meditation. I truly feel that it's very important for us to not only vote for someone, but to actually participate in holding them, that they have the goodness and the clarity and the wisdom to represent everyone. We do have a second part of our uh, institute meditation. It's called Knowings. And people around the world every week send in questions that they would like for us to focus upon in order to feel an uplifting energy and an illumination. So Allison will tell us the questions that have come this week. Allison? The first question is from Dresden, Germany. Will you please explain how the highest good operates? I've been told by so many spiritual coaches that if I want to manifest something, that it must be for the highest good. What if what I want, with no ill intention, is not for the highest good, even though it's something that I would love, like a lot of money? Will it not happen? 
And how do I know what the highest good is? Oh, Chris, I hope this isn't a question too silly for you, because I really need help with this, and no one seems to be able to give me an answer. They just keep saying it must be for the highest good. <laughs> Nothing is too silly here. <laughs> and this really tickles me to think that we're still in a place where, where people want to say you can only do it if you do it in the way that's supposed to be for the highest good. We cannot ever know really what is the highest good because sometimes something that causes a problem for a moment actually turns out to be the thing that elevates or, or uh, frees someone to travel forward. So that concept of the highest good is you know, very germane to somebody's own thought forms. And the second part that tickles me with that is it, it, it is conveying a concept that says you have to do it this way or else it won't happen or something else will. You know, as if you could be punished because you didn't do it somehow right. These are old, old thought forms that belong to primordial times. They don't belong to now. There's nobody up there um, focusing so much on you to say, you didn't do that quite purely enough. And so you can let go with a little giggle about that one. And then, let's talk about that concept, because I love that you mentioned money, because I feel that the sense of abundance, whether it's about having money or food or health or love or whatever it is, is very important in today's world. So the more abundant that you can feel, the more you will radiate that out from you and create a ripple that will trigger uh, a like energy in others. So we have to let go of the idea that, of course, if you had money, you wouldn't share it or it wouldn't be it wouldn't be for the highest good. I would say perhaps maybe for the good of the whole, which means there is a, a thought form that comes truly from the Native Americans in, in, in where I live, which has to do with a, a concept of sort of pay it forward, which means that if you could manifest for yourself wonderful abundance, who would say that you're not the kind of person who would not pay it forward, meaning you would find a way to help others be abundant. Whether you give a small amount of money to somebody else, which I think my higher self always says, whatever you want, give that. So if you want money, give a little money someplace and know that you are already paying it forward, meaning that you're offering it so that and the good of the whole is that the good for you influences the good for others. And it can be in any way that pleases you. It could be in a project that you engage in. It could be in the way that you relate to someone. There are infinite ways to, again, take that abundance and, and share it. Um, not because you have to, not because of some self-righteousness that says you can't be stingy or, or self-centered. No, none of those things but because you have the power. This is the thing about abundance. We have the power to give. And that giving can take any form, it can be to anyone. It's the consciousness that you have that says, I'm so abundant, let me, let me pass it out. Again, it's not about the old idea of you, you have to give a certain amount. It has nothing to do with what you have to do, but what would bring you joy to do. And so, uh, go ahead and focus your magnetism on attracting money to you, knowing that you might do it well, or whatever that you want to do, and, and realize that uh, if something supports you, it is already for the highest good, because each one of us is a gift. We have come to give our gifts into this world. Great love and abundance to you. Allison. The second question is from Geneva, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Will you please talk about the importance of letting go and adapting to new situations without hanging on to the point of destruction? Mm -hmm. I'm asking you this question so I can show your video to a friend of mine 
He was drowning in the past and having serious emotional and physical issues because of it. Mm -hmm. There is a source for that, a source that can be changed. And that is that what's causing the holding on is that your friend uh, is identifying through whatever it is that they're holding on to, whether it's objects, a place, or a person. Very often when someone has passed from the body, we have many ways in our cultures that say, I'm a good person because I am holding on, when in fact, cosmic lies, those who have passed from their bodies, would want you to go on, to love again, to recreate who you are. At the Light Institute, we're having our last intensive, uh, which is called the Art of Self-Design in a week. And that's what I'm talking about. He said at every moment in our lives, we must, we must, because it influences our sense of purpose and our sense of joy and our destiny to continually reinvent who we are, to see what we have to give, to see what's true for us. And so uh, what I would say to your friend is, you don't have to hold on. Look and see what are the hooks that say, but I don't know who I am if I'm not attached to that. You are yourself. You were yourself before you were attached to that. And you must be yourself again. And that self is not who you were in the past. With that thing that you're a person you're attached to, or even before that. And so it is wonderful and exciting and fun to begin to say, who am I now? Let me, let me feel the freedom to reinvent myself. And the more that if you look within and see, um, were you, um, was your sense of self tied there for security? Was it for uh, something that you felt made you look more powerful or more acceptable to the outside world? Because really when we identify with something outside us, it's really old, old um, cultural and, and primordial concepts that say, if I'm not chosen or if I'm not accepted, then I'll have no value. Even sometimes in our families, uh, we have been told only if you're this way do you have value, if you're smart or you're beautiful or you have things that you're valuable. None of this is true. None of this is true. We want to use this embodiment from this moment on. And so, um, uh, I would really truly recommend to look within and and see what is it that makes you hooked there. Perhaps you have contracts and vows within your own soul with a person that said, we'll always be together or I'll never leave you. Those are the things that through incarnational work we at the Light Institute release so that we're not carrying vows and contracts that, that block us from the wonderful uh, capacity to go forward until the last second of our breaths, of our lives, when we have done it and we're ready to go home. So I send my support and my love to your friend to begin the adventure. You have permission, you have the right to reinvent yourself, so let go and feel that you could decide who you are and what's of value to you. Great love. Allison. The last question is from New York City, New York in the USA. Chris, all of my friends drink vats of coffee each day <laughs> and they are all wired and fried <laughs> all the time, uh -huh. except when they crash and they are anxious all the time. It just occurred to me that maybe there's a connection there. Do you think coffee creates anxiety? And does it disrupt the pure flow of the chi in the body? Well, in fact, there's really nothing through consciousness that can disrupt the pure chi of the body. At any moment, we have uh, that homeostasis uh, capacity. We fall off, or we get anxious, or we get disturbed, and then we come back. 
And it is only the self that brings us back and the choice to say, let me find my center. That's why it's so important to meditate. And I always say, you can meditate at any moment. I am meditating. Now, this thing about coffee. <laughs> we know that coffee does have some good things uh, uh, that it offers the body, if you were to have one cup, perhaps, in the morning. But the thing about coffee is that it is addictive. So anything to which we're addicted, whether that's a TV show, or a, something we eat, or a person, or uh, pills that we take, or whatever. Uh, those things pull us away from our true selves. And so, an addiction like coffee, of course, will create anxiety. And we have to think of that, about this, not only from the physiological body, but the emotional body and the mind body as well. Because one of the things that coffee does, which is perhaps uh, something that happens everywhere is that it helps us to have our morning constitutional. And if we do not release from our bowels, it blocks our breath uh, because they're connected. Our breath and our bowels are connected. And so uh, we, we feel anxious if we haven't cleared those energies. This is on a cellular level. Sometimes we're not even aware that we're holding that kind of anxiety. Uh, when we become hyper, we begin to uh, run after our lives, which I think is true of most big cities. It's get up and get going and, and win the race and be at the top and all of those things. And, and it's not uh, bad to, to want to accomplish a goal or, or to be at the top. But when it takes us forward, when it takes us out of the moment, because uh, we're stimulating our brain and, and, of course, we're stimulating our hearts and, and our other organs as well, which may not be so, uh, so good, let's say. So what I would say is that uh, it would be wonderful if, if your friends could realize that they could, they could stimulate their awakeness in ways that are actually healthy for them and that they could begin to calm that down. It's also a cultural thing. Let's go out for coffee, or, or I'm having a coffee break. You know, at a coffee break, you could drink some water, which would be much more help, helpful to the, to the uh, accessing your mental faculties, your brain, in, in effect. You know, uh, I, for example, when I need to be really awake, I use essential oil of peppermint. Peppermint stimulates the body, but without creating all of these sidelines of palpitating heart or, or rushing or uh, anxiety. Uh, it simply wakes us up and it helps our digestion and it uh, facilitates our brains. And so there are many other ways that you could have that same uh, powerful focus without in the end, imbalancing, because it is true. If you're having many, many cups of coffee, mm -hmm. you will run ahead of your body, and, and when we do that, uh, we, we don't have uh, the gifts that our consciousness, that our emotions could give us. So I would say, uh, in, in every way that we have any addictions to anything, we want to look at that and release that so that there isn't that anxiety, what if I don't have it? To always be ourselves, to always be able to choose, you know. Uh, and the last thing that I would say is that if you learn to ask your body, do you want that fourth cup of coffee? I promise you, your coffee, your body would say, no, thank you. So then you could say, would you like some green tea? Would you like some water? Would you like something else? Uh, and so the more that we listen to our bodies, the more we bring about that homeostasis that I was talking about, that balancing. And when we have that balance, we are not anxious, we are not um, concerned about something that's not even here yet, but we are centered. And so uh, we want to allow ourselves to be centered. It's a choice, and we can learn to command that of our body and our emotions so that we can feel joy 
and peace. Great love.